accomplish the thing and went through it's been sent. So it's good to have you with us tonight as I share the word of God with you. I want to talk upon a subject matter that God quickened in my heart as I was meditating today. I, I began a journey five days ago called <clears throat> my 40-day journey. And basically my 40-day journey is a declaration of complete consecration, separation, sanctification, purification. 40 days. Where I'm striving to bring every thought, every desire, every attitude, every emotion, every word into line with God's will. Crucifying the flesh, not speaking evil of anyone. Believing with all my heart that God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him, that he'll bring transformation to myself within 40 days. And I got to meditating today as I was just going through the scriptures, going through the epistles of Paul. I got to thinking about God's relationship with man. That if you go back to Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3, that if you can get a revelation of Genesis 1, 2, and 3, you can, to a great extent, understand what salvation is all about. Because in Genesis 1, God said that Elohim, which actually was speaking to the Father, the Word, and the Spirit, they all agree together in one, that the Father, the Word, and the Spirit said, let us make man in our likeness and our image. And he created man for oneness with him, relationship. Now, we don't really know how much time transpired from the time that God created man until he made the woman, until they both were there with him in the garden. Now, we do know after the fall of man that at that moment, it says that they heard the voice of God in the garden. They heard the voice of God. I got to thinking about this. They knew the voice of God. They had been walking with God. They had been fellowshipping with God. They had been having oneness with God. And all of a sudden, they heard the voice of God. But before they committed sin, and of course, when they heard the voice of God, they ran from God. Now, of course, we would say the voice of God is the word of God. So we could take a look on the other side of the transgression of man and say all that Adam and his wife knew was the word of God. That was their meat, their drink. That was all they knew. And knowing nothing but the word of God, they, they didn't know anything else, nothing else. All that filled their mind, all that filled their ears. Now, they heard the voices of creation, but all of them were in harmony with God. None of them were in disagreement with God. Every voice they heard was in harmony with God. Now, whether or not animals could communicate in a vocabulary that they understand or not, because it does not seem to me that the woman was surprised when the serpent, the snake, began to speak to her. So let's just assume, for instance, the animals could speak to some extent to where Adam and his wife could understand. Still, everything that was spoken on the earth in that time was in agreement with God. It not only was in agreement with God, but it fortified everything that God said. But then one day, another voice came into the garden. Now we know who it was. It was the enemy, the devil, Satan, who had entered into the snake and began to speak to the woman. And he gave to the woman words. Now these words were contradictory to the word that she had been hearing all this time. She had been hearing the word of God. She had been feasting, drinking, sleeping, thinking, singing the word of God. Now, how, how do I know that? Because God is full of wisdom. I, I'm totally convinced that Adam and his wife were not walking around empty-headed. That there was wonderful things. And matter of fact, the Bible says that Adam knew better. Adam was not ignorant. Their mind was filled with nothing but the will, the word, the truth, the light, the revelation, the understanding, the wisdom of God. And then another voice comes along, and this voice contradicts 
the voice of God, the word of God, and the woman is deceived into believing that word which this voice spoke. And it brought death. So as I'm speaking, I hope the light will come on for you. See, there's many voices in the world today. There is still the voice of God in the earth today. There is the word of God in the earth today. But then there is the other voices which are contradictory to the word. Now, isn't it amazing in the Gospel of John, as Christ is introduced to us, it says, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was nothing made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. What is that light? That light is the voice of the Father, the word of the Father, the wisdom, the revelation, the understanding. So Christ comes, and he gives to us the word of the Father. Now remember, before man committed sin, there was no sickness, there was no disease, there was no poverty, there was no famine. There was no fear, there was no hate, there was no anger, there was no lust. There was no distrust, there was no jealousy, there was no death. It was just heaven on earth. But when this other voice came along, Pandora's box opened up and nothing but disaster came. Now, we know that I am the Lord and I change not. So, Whatever God has done before, he's more than willing to do it because he's still the same God. So we know when Jesus walked the earth, the disciples said to him, Lord, teach us how to pray. And he taught him a prayer. He said, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. So he's trying to take the mindset of his disciples and to get their eyes off of this physical flesh and blood world we're living in and he's trying to lift their eyes up to the realm of the heavenly father in the first place he's trying to create within them a reverence an awe a divine comprehension of who the father is and then he has them pray a prayer he says thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven now in heaven i can guarantee the voice of the accuser is no longer there. All you hear in heaven is voices. Oh, you're going to hear many voices. You're going to hear the angelic host. You're going to hear the saints. And they're singing, worthy, 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 and holy, holy, holy. But I, I just, I, I'm trying to, by the Spirit of God, I just want to baby step you into what I want to share with you. Because I believe it will be, it will bring absolute amazing transformation. Wonderful transformation supernatural transformation like a metamorphosis like a caterpillar who's wrapped itself in the cocoon and now it breaks forth and it spreads its wings and it begins to fly or like a little eaglet that breaks out of the egg begins to stretch its wings and when maturity is there the feathers grow sufficiently from the food that the mother is feeding that little eaglet the father it will stretch his wings and it will fly up into the heavenlies. And so here we see that the voice of the Father, the voice of the Son, the voice of the Holy Ghost is flooding heaven. Heaven is filled with nothing but the voice. Holy, holy, holy. That's the voice of God speaking. But when another voice came into the garden, a voice contradictory to the voice of God, it brought death. Well, if a voice that was contradictory to the voice of God brought death, brought destruction, brought fear, brought anxiety, brought hate, brought murder, brought rape, brought disaster, well then let's reverse it. Let's just simply go back to what brings life. The voice is contradictory to the will of God in the Father's opinion is dark. It's darkness, it's evil, it's wicked. It's what we would call sin. Sin, and he said to the woman, he said, how did this happen? Well, she said, I, I listened to the voice of the snake. I listened to the wrong voice.
voice. Well, if listening to the wrong voice brings death, then listening to the right voice will bring life. If we really had time, I could show you this, because really all that God was trying to do was to get man to come back and to begin to the, listen to the right voices, his voice. He said, hearken to my commandments, obey my commandments, listen to what I have to say, because if you will listen to me, Jesus said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. The context of John 10, 10, is that of a shepherd and his sheep. And he says, my sheep hear my voice. Now, there's many scriptures we could refer to this, but if we would just take a look at Israel, the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Joseph had gone down into Egypt by the will of God to prepare the nation to feed God's people during a time of great famine. God had told Abraham for 430 years, your descendants will be slaves. So the day comes when finally they're going to be delivered. How are they going to be delivered? By a man by the name of Moses who hears the voice of God. He goes to the burning bush. God gives him the words to speak. He goes back to Egypt. He speaks the words of the Lord. God brings miracle after miracle, deliverance after deliverance, judgment after judgment, because they would not hearken to his word. Notice, when you do not hearken to the word of God, it brings judgment. It brings death. Why? Because if you're not listening to God, it means you're listening to a voice contrary to God. But finally, Moses takes him out of Egypt, brings him through the Red Sea on dry land, gets him over there into the wilderness, and then he goes up. And for 40 days, he's up there on the mountain. He comes down at the end of 40 days, and God had given to him the word. He brought the Ten Commandments. And then, of course, we know that they had, built a, they, they had designed a golden calf, and so he got upset, and he broke those two tablets which God had written with his fingertip. Can you imagine? God had written with his fingertip on two stone tablets. He gave him the word. He wrote it with his fingers. Of course, then, after he went down and busted the tablets, he had to go back up to the mountain for another 40 days. At the end, isn't it amazing? 40 days, 40 days. At the end of 40 days, <laughs> he came down with another set of tablets. And then the children of Israel said, we will keep his commandments. That's, that's the covenant they had. The covenant that God gave to the seed of Abraham is we will hearken to your voice we will listen to no other voices. We will listen to your voice, and we will obey and do what you tell us to do. So wherever you lead us, that's where we're going to go. However you want us to think, that's how we're going to think. However you want us to eat, that's how we're going to eat. However we're going to dress, that's how we're going to dress. Now, I want you to see this. This is the revelation of the voice of God. Now, we know the old covenant was a typology, a shadow, an illustration. Every this is every Levitical law, every custom, every tradition, every Sabbath, every holiday, every sacrifice, every stitch of clothes that they wore in line with the voice of God given to Moses for them was a typology of them eating the flesh of Jesus and drinking his blood. See, it was all an illustration so when they listen to his word, have you ever heard somebody say, I, I just drank in his words? Or maybe there's music you really liked and you just kind of like kicked back and you absorbed the song that you liked because you could relate with it. It did something for you. Well, I want you to see this is what was happening in the wilderness. They were absorbing and eating the will of the Father the voice of God, and it says their clothes did not wear out, their shoes did not wear out, 
neither was there one feeble among their tribe. See, as they began to hearken to the voice of God, it began to bring heaven to earth. It began to bring transformation. And we know that when they finally got to the land of promise and they went in for 40 days to investigate it and they came out and they said, sure enough, the word of the Lord is true. What God said through Moses is true. It's a land that flows with milk and honey. It's wonderful. But the devil whispered to their eyes because they saw the inhabitants and God didn't tell them. He already told them, hey, the Canaanites are there, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the giants. Don't worry about them. He said they're bread for you to eat. He told them that before they ever checked it out but they got moved by what they saw they began to listen to the wrong voice and a spirit of fear came into them how do spirits come into us by listening to wrong voices but not hearkening to the voice of God now this is this we don't have a lot of time and maybe I'll pick this up because I'm talking about how you can walk with God I'm telling you right now listen Adam walked with God Abel walked with God Enoch walked with God and was not translated. Noah walked with God and he became the savior of the world. Abraham walked with God, but God had to separate Abraham from the Chaldeans. He had to get him away from all these voices, all these voices. And that's why he took even John the Baptist as a young man and he took him into the wilderness. He had to get him away from all these voices, these voices that were contradictory to the word of God. That were against the word of God. See, all man lived by was the word of God. That's all man lived by. Oh, Pastor Mike, that's not enough. You can't just live on the word of God. Well, wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. Why can't you? Why can't you? Won't, won't God? I believe, I really believe that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not study the math the science, the geology of Nebuchadnezzar or of the Chaldeans. I believe all they did was meditate and study the word of God and God showed them what to say, showed them what to do, gave them witty inventions, gave them Wonderful ideals by the meditation of the word of God. So he gets them into the wilderness. They go to the land of promise. They come back and they go contrary to the word. Contrary to the word. They're arguing with Joshua. They're arguing with Caleb. They want to kill him because they have allowed the voice of the enemy to take a hold of their hearts. So God, he says, listen, I, I can't. If you're not going to listen to my word, I can't do nothing for you. Because it's the word that brings life. He sent his word and he healed them and delivered them from all their destructions. He's exalted his word above his name. He upholds all things by the power of his word. It says that the Father begot us with his word, that we're born of the incorruptible seed of the word of life. We're born again by the word. Desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby spiritually. And so now we're trying to grow spiritually without the word of God. But it's impossible because the word of God is the voice of God. It's the will of God. It's the personality of God. It's the character of God. It's the plan of God. It is life. It is life. It tells us that in Psalms chapter 1, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight, his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law does he meditate day and night. In his law does he meditate day and night. He doesn't meditate on the weather. He doesn't meditate on the news. He doesn't meditate on what's going on in society. He doesn't meditate on what people are doing. He meditates upon the word of God night and day and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that will bring forth his fruit in due season and whatsoever he does shall prosper and his leaf shall not wither even in his old age because he gave himself to the word of God oh this is it's so simple it's so it's so simple and yet we're so stupid because the enemy of our soul knows he's got to stop us 
from listening to the word of God. Hiding the word of God in our heart. That's what David said. David said, oh, as I was musing, the fire burned. I've hid your word in my heart somehow. In order to get David to sin, he had to get David to take his eyes off of the word of God. Now, so when they came out of Canaan with an, with an evil report, an evil report, remember, any voice that is against the will and the word of God is an evil report. I don't care who says it. Now, don't misunderstand me. Jesus was surrounded with evil reports. Completely surrounded, but he was like a tender root growing up out of dry ground. For it was all this evil coming at him, bombarding him, did not affect him. Why? Because his eyes, his mind, his ears were in tune with God. Like a walkie-talkie, you can tune in a certain channel and you tune out everything else. You tune it in, you tune it in, you tune in the voice of God. It's so, I really believe, well, let me tell you what God says then. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 8, you can read this when you get a chance. It's very important. I know it's Old Covenant, but if you can, if you can believe what I'm about to share with you, if you can really grab it, if you can really take a hold of it, if you can really set your face like a flint, if you will really determine in your heart to do what I am talking, you will prosper, you will have good success, you will overcome, you will prevail, you will be a, a, a double stomping, holy ghost, spirit filled, powerful man and woman of God. No if, ands, or but. You, and not, no enemy will be able to stand before you all the days of your life if you'll just hearken to what I'm about to share with you. Listen to what God spoke in Deuteronomy 8.2. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness. Why? Why did they keep going around the mountain and around the mountain and around the mountain? Why do people keep on going through fits of depression and fear and anger and frustration and habitual habits and negative things? People who call themselves Christians, people who say they know Christ, people who are born again, people who speak in tongues, people who prophesy. Why? Why are they living such defeated lives? He tells us why. To he says, you are in the wilderness to humble you, to prove you, listen, to know what was in your heart. What's in your heart? Whether thou wouldest keep his commandments. <laughs> you're in the wilderness because God's going to find out if you're going to do are you going to hearken? Are you going to listen to what I'm telling you? No matter how you feel, no matter how it looks, no matter how bad it gets, no matter how many people rise up against you, I, I want you to find out, have you set your face like a flint? Have you said, Lord, I've made up my mind. I know the answer. I know the solution. I know the antidote. I know the remedy. I know the way. I, I know the straight and narrow way. It's your voice. It's your word. I'm going to hearken to your word. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with the manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man does not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord does man live. So how do we live? See, this, this may sound like, oh, I don't know if I can live off of God's word. Do you understand? That's what you were made to live off of. And when man stopped living by the voice of God is when death came in. Now, if death came into the human race by listening to a voice contradictory to the word of God, then how does life come in? By hearkening to the voice of your shepherd. Oh. Life, life, life will come flooding your soul. What is it? What, what did Paul say in Romans chapter 12? I beseech you. He said, I beg you, brethren, by the mercies of God, which is your reasonable service, that you would present your body 
a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, and be not conformed to this world. That means don't hearken yourself to what they're telling you. Don't listen to what they're saying. Don't be moved by the voice of the world, the flesh, and the devil, the cares of life, the deceitfulness of riches, of other things. It says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do we do that? It tells us in Ephesians chapter 5, where he says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church. And he gave himself for it, that he might cleanse it and wash it and sanctify it by the washing of the water by the word. The word, the word, the word. He says, I kept you in the wilderness 40 years for you could learn one thing, just one simple truth, that if you want life, you must get it from nothing but the truth. You shall know the truth. You've got to know it. I can't just, I can't know it for you. You've got to know it. If you will know the truth and nothing but the truth, nothing but the truth, if you will know, now there ain't nothing wrong with reading books, but here's the problem of Christian writers. Many books are not in agreement with this book. Their experiences, their confessions, their revelations, their understandings are not in agreement with this book. Whew. You can come into agreement with this book. He says, I kept you out there in the wilderness. For you can just learn one simple thing. Just one simple thing. Learn the vocabulary of heaven. Learn the language of heaven. Learn what they're singing in heaven now. What they're saying in heaven now. What they're proclaiming in heaven now. What heaven is filled with. The language of heaven is the word of God. That you might learn that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Now, I think that's important. And Jesus said this when he was being tempted of the devil in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, when the devil showed up after the 40 days, and he says, man, because he said, turn this rock into bread, this physical bread. Use the power of God for your selfish needs. And Jesus said, no, 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 no. He said, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Now, let me ask you something. Is that what you are living by? I really don't know very many people. I, see, what, what I would do through the years, I, I, would, I would live off of the word and I would mingle it. Did you know that's why in the, in the Levitical laws, they weren't allowed to mix linen and cotton and different kinds of clothes. They had clean animals and unclean animals. They had animals they were allowed to eat that was symbolic of the word of God. And animals they were not allowed to eat. That was symbolic of listening to what the world, the flesh, and the devil says. Why would Jesus, there was a, a, a husband and a wife whose daughter was sick. Uh, actually died. So Jesus goes to their house. Everybody's weeping and wailing and crying. He makes everybody get out. You know why? Because all their voice was, despair, agony, defeat, and death. That's all they were saying. He said, okay, you got to get out. You all clear out. She's not dead. She's only asleep. They laughed him to scorn. Oh, you're nuts. No, no, no. That's how God sees it. You see death. God says they're sleeping like Lazarus. Four days in the tomb. Jesus says he's asleep. Martha and Mary says, Lord, he stinks by now. You, you see, one voice says, there's no hope. The other voice says, I'm your hope. One voice says, impossible. You can't live above sin. You can't overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. You can't obey God. The other voice says, you can do all things through me because I strengthen you. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Amen. We have great hope. We have great confidence. We know in whom we trust. 
And all I got to do, you know, even in the natural, my, my, my daughter has done a lot of research on, on diets, people's diets, how they eat. And my daughter actually has lost 50 pounds, over 50 pounds. But my daughter discovered something that we are what we eat. And that a lot of people's problems, and there's many testimonies in the natural of people who had cancer, who had arthritis, who had sugar diabetes. And all they would have to do is change what they're eating. And these testimonies are people who did it. They changed what they were eating. There was just another person my daughter's telling me of that this person was 68 years old, had incurable cancer. Uh, they said there was no hope. Uh, said, okay, I'm going to start cutting certain things out. I'm going to start eating certain things. Now, this is in the natural. This is in the physical world, okay? I'm telling you spiritually, I'm telling you spiritually that if you would change your diet, if you would change what you are eating, what you are drinking, what you are thinking, if you would begin to renew your mind, I'm telling you the life of God would explode inside of you and you would become like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters would not fail and he'll make fat your bones and, and, and you'll, 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 you cannot believe where God would take you because really all he's trying to get you to do is to agree with him. <laughs> he's just trying to take you out of the darkness of the lies of the voices of the enemy that says God's a liar. He's trying to rob you from having fun. He just doesn't like you to have your own personal space. No, no, I was made to walk with God. And so he tells the Israelites, oh, he said, the only thing I was trying to tell you is that every word that comes out of the mouth of the Lord is what you live by. He says, and during that time period, thy raiment did not wax old, neither did your feet swell, neither was there one feeble among your tribe. Now, can you understand? We're talking about old covenant now. We're not talking about new covenant. We're not talking about the blood and the flesh of Jesus that had literally yet been shed. They were looking into the future and they were persuaded. They embraced and they confessed. So now we have Christ in us. See, when Jesus said this, he said, listen, he said, he that is least in the kingdom is greater than John the Baptist. That's what he said. That's what he said. So he that is least... Why? Because they didn't have what we got now. We've got Christ in us. We've got the Holy Ghost. We've got the revelation that has been given to us through the words of Jesus, through Paul, Peter, James, John, Jude. Wow! Look at all the good food we can eat. Look at the smorgasbord. Look at the table that has been laid before us in the presence of our enemies. And here's the wonderful thing. I know that if you go to somebody's house and the Bible says that it's better to take a knife to your throat than to overeat, but you can eat this all you want. And all it's going to do is produce faith, revelation, the character of God, the personality of God, the life of God. See, the life of God is in this seed. It is seed. It is seed. He talks about the sower who went forth and sowed the seed. And some of the seed did not grow because here's the key. There was in the ground thorns and weeds and thistles and it sucked the life of the word of God. So this is so important. You and I, if we take this word and then we mingle it with the voice of the world in whatever form, whatever fashion, it will choke the power out of this word. It will choke it out. How about, what did he, what did he tell Joshua? Old covenant, Joshua. He said, Joshua, he said, uh, he said I, I don't want you to turn 
in Joshua chapter 1, verse 7. He said, only be thou strong and very, very courageous. And he said, hearken to the commandments that Moses, my servant, gave you. And don't turn from it to the right hand or to the left. And let me read that before I close. And I just want to share a story with you. But he said, he, he said turn not from it to the right hand or to the left. Why? That thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. <laughs> this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. See, what you're saying is what you're thinking. It's what you're believing because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So he said, now Joshua, listen, this is what Moses said. The Spirit of God spoke to Joshua. He said, but thou shalt meditate there and day and night. Now notice, meditation, meditation is not memorization. Meditation is what you do when you worry about something, when you get aggravated about something. When you get upset about something, you just can't stop. You just can't stop thinking about it. You just got to talk about it. You just got to bring it back up. You'll run into people that something happened 50 years ago, and they keep bringing it back up. I, I forgave them, but let me tell you, no, they didn't forgive. If you forgave, you wouldn't keep bringing it up. So that thing's been cooking in your oven, and what is it producing? It's producing stink, death, misery, pain, sorrow. You're cooking the wrong goose. You got the wrong food in the oven. But if you would meditate upon the word, meditate on the word, meditate on the word, I mean it, just meditate on the word. I want to encourage you, man, take this 40-day journey, man. Just shut off the stupid news. Even shut off the weather channel. Shut off newspapers. Shut off sports. Shut off everything as much as possible and just begin to hide the word of God in your heart. I'm not talking about memorizing whole books of the Bible. I, I, I fell into this by accident. I really didn't know what was going on some years ago when this happened. But he says, but thou shalt meditate there and day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written there. And I want you to know the enablement, the empowerment to do it comes from meditation. I'll give you an example. Jesus said, a person doesn't commit adultery when they do it in the physical but when they look upon it with their eyes. Why? Because he knows that if they keep looking, it will overtake them and they will find themselves doing it. You get to thinking about buying something, you'll end up buying it. You get to thinking long enough, you'll find a way to get it. Because your thoughts literally are like physical food. Physical food, if you eat food, it's going to get into you. Well, I can, I can eat all this food with, with lots of uh, calcium and calories and all kinds of bad stuff. Hey, it won't affect me. Oh, yes, it will affect you. It will. It'll, it'll, end up on, it'll end up around your waist. I mean, it will get on you. Well, listen, what you're meditating on, what you're thinking on, what you're looking at will get into you, and it will affect you, and it will make you who you are. You are right now based upon what you've been meditating on. What you've been meditating and medicating on is who you are. You are what you are now because of what you've been meditating on. So he said, Joshua, meditate upon my word night and day that you may be able to observe to do all that is written there. And then he, he makes an amazing statement here. He said, for then thou shall make thy way prosperous <laughs> and then thou shalt have good success how many know that God is not a respecter of people God doesn't respect people listen a plot of dirt it don't care what kind of seed you plant in it you got to plant the right seed but one thing is very important you can have good soil you can have plowed and everything but you got to keep that puppy weeded man you don't keep it weeded I don't care you can have the top notch hybrid uh, uh, seeds that there is available and I'm telling you right now you're not going to get nothing man because those weeds will suck the life out of those good plants I, uh, I heard a guy, about a guy by the name of Smith Wigglesworth who really wasn't walking with God, living for God. He had in his younger years, he actually was a plumber. And then he heard about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And he, when he got the Holy Ghost, and the Spirit of God came on him. And, but one thing about Smith, he couldn't read. He, quit, he, he had a third grade education, and he couldn't really read very well. 
But after he got filled with the Holy Ghost, he picked up his Bible and he began to read it. And he never put down his Bible for the next, well, it was close to 40 years. 40 years he never put down his Bible. You'd go to his house. And, and I know the guy, uh, Lester Summer, I was ordained through Lester. He tells this story. He told the story. He was only a young preacher of 18 years old. He went to, he, he went to Smith Wigglesworth's house with a newspaper under his arm. And when he got to the door, Smith Wigglesworth said, now Smith Wigglesworth was a man who had amazing miracles, amazing miracles. I mean, raising people from the dead, praying for people with amputated legs, uh, going in. He would actually go into schools, blind, schools for blind people, and every blind person would get healed, and they would shut the school down. He would go to mental institutions, and they would shut down that place where they had mental people. He'd go in there, and he'd just go through there like a cyclone. And yet he had just been nothing but a plumber. And yet this man who was a plumber, he got so full of God that no sickness or no disease or no devil could resist him. Why? Because all he did was fill his heart with the word of God. <laughs> That's all he did. He filled his heart with the word of God. Will you believe this? He said, if you abide in me and my word abides in you. Jesus said this. If you abide in me and my word abides in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done. And so Lester somewhere goes to, and I don't know why Lester didn't get it, but why didn't I get it? Why haven't I got it? I walked into this realm back when Michael was first born, 32 years ago. But here he brought this newspaper, and Lester, he came to Smith's house, and Smith says, what's that under your arm? He said, well, it's the newspaper. He said, son, leave that outside. He thought he was joking. He laughed. He said, what? He said, son, don't let that come into my house. He laughed. So he walked up on the porch. He told this story. He said, Smith grabbed the newspaper. And I'm not saying Smith was kind of uncouth, but he is still full of the word. I'm not saying we should follow in the steps of Smith when it came to some of his attitudes and how he treated people, but he was still full of the word. <laughs> he was still full of the word. And so he grabbed the newspaper and threw it out in the bushes. He said, I told you, young man. And he spoke with that Welsh accent. I don't want that in my house. So Smith came in. He said, son, before we talk, let's read a little bit of the Bible. He sat down. They didn't have MP3 players. They didn't have CDs. They didn't have cassettes. Praise God, we got that today. Amen. You can listen to the word over your phone. And so he sat down and he read some scriptures. By that time, his daughter had prepared some food. And so I think her name was Molly or Polly or Sano. So he went in and they had, and before they ate, he, he said, I like to read the word before I eat. So he read some more word and he prayed. And they ate. He went back into the front room. He said, son, before we talk anymore, he said, I want to read some of the word. And so he read he read Lester Summer some of the word. He got done. He said, I'm sorry, young, young man. He said, I got to spend some time in prayer. You're going to have to leave. <laughs> Lester said he never got a chance to even talk to him about what he came for. But all that Smith did was the word, the word, the word, the word, the word. So, but he never mixed it. Here's the thing. You cannot mix the word of God with anything else. You got to hide the word in your heart, meditate upon the word night and day, and don't mix nothing else with it. So back, I was pastoring in Assembly God Church back in 19, um, 1980. When were you born, Mike? What year? 81. So it was the end of 80. It was beginning of 81. And I was leaving that church. Now, I had seen God do some wonderful things. I had some miracles because I had been in the word. I really didn't know a lot of scripture but I knew a good amount. I probably knew more than most preachers that I knew because how many of you notice we have a real lack of W-O-R-D in many preacher sermons? 
And that's why we don't have the power of God manifested because there's very little W-O-R-D. And so you're no threat to the devil because the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and faith that comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. And the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than the added two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifested in his sight, but all things are naked and opened to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. But there is very little word. So here I am, to, uh, 1981, and I'm leaving this church. And so I decide, well, I did begin years ago taking just three scriptures a day and memorizing them. I did me meditate on them. I memorized them. I memorized them, but... You know, so I got myself some big three-by-five cards. I still have them. Some of them are really ragged now. And I wrote, I began to write out. We didn't have computers in those days. I wrote them out. Wrote out scriptures that was quickening me, calling me, and I'll answer you and show you great and mighty things which I'll know what's not. You know of Jesus of Nazareth, the one about doing good and healing all who are oppressed of the devil. Because God was, and on and on. So I wrote these scriptures out, and I would take each card, get up early in the morning. I had nothing else to do, and I just began to memorize these scriptures. Some of them I already knew. And then after I memorized them, I just would walk around talking to myself like a lunatic, just mumbling away, just mumbling away. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel of the poor. He sent me heal, to heal, to heal, to heal, to heal the brokenhearted, to preach, to preach, to preach, to preach deliverance to the captives, to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind. And I just began to speak the word, speak the word, speak the word. I mean, I felt God moving in my heart, but I didn't really, there was no real major change in my prayer time. But then I went up to Mifflin County for a God's Businessmen's meeting. I still remember it. I walked into this meeting, and I sat down. I knew I was the speaker. I was only, what, 27, 28, something like that. I sat down, and then I didn't feel nothing. And they said, okay, we're going to stand over here, and we're going to pray. Now, I've only been doing this for maybe, I think, a month, maybe a little bit longer. And I hadn't been preaching because I haven't had a chance. This is the first chance I had a chance to preach since I had been doing nothing. Now, during this time, there was nothing else coming into my mind or my heart. Nothing else. Nothing else. I wasn't reading technology. I wasn't looking at sports. I wasn't, didn't have a... I wasn't listening to radio. I wasn't even really, I'm not really into Christian music to a great extent. I'd rather listen to the word of God. So I'm just hearing the word, hearing the word, hearing the word. So we, they said, will you come? And they didn't even ask me to pray. And I got in a circle and there was a real tall man next to me. I took a hold of his hand, an older man. I took a hold of his hand. We're standing there praying. I did not feel a single thing. No, nothing. Didn't feel a thing. We got done praying. And this guy is all shook up. He looks down at me. He said, what was that? What was that? What was that? I said, what? Something, something came out of you, shot up my arm, through my body, through my face. I said, I don't know. I said, I didn't feel anything. At the end of the service, he came up crying, crying, tears rolling down his face. I still he said, look at my eyes, look at my eyes. I looked up and I still remember his eyes were Pure crystal blue. I mean, I hate to say it, the man had beautiful eyes. But he said, you don't understand. He said, my eyes were covered with cataracts. He said, the minute you touched me, he said, the cataracts melted off my eyeballs. And then that became a wild night. For the next three years, off of that little bit of infilling, which during those three years, all I did was stay in the word. I entered into a realm where I would stand in front and whole congregations would begin to fall under the power of God. The word of knowledge just began to flow. At that meeting, I began to call out the Amish women and the Brethren women and the Mennonite women and the men. And before they got from here to the beginning of those chairs, they began to melt and fall to the floor. What did you do, Pastor Mike? I did nothing but meditate on his word. I wasn't even fasting. I just was hiding his word in my heart. Now, I know I have a lot more of the Bible inside of me now, and I've seen flashes like that through the years, but as I look back, it was every time I sanctified myself. 
It was every time I purged anything out of my heart but the word of God. Today I was uh, going up to Hershey. I'm just meditating on a word and meditating on a word and meditating on a word, and God just began to deal with me. He said, son, you're stupid. I said, I know I am. He said, you were walking in this realm 30 years ago. I said, Lord, I know. I said, why do you keep mixing, contaminating, and corrupting my word with other useless stuff? I said, I don't know, God. I said, I, I he said, I want you to get free from this now. He said, I want you to be completely free. Just be free and just, he said, because I've got to use you as an example. I, I've, got to, I've got to be able to point to people and they're going to say, how is it that God is moving in your life in such a powerful way? Is it because you, you pray eight hours a day in tongues? No. You fast 30 days out of, out of every two months? No. You pray eight hours a day? No, even though I pray without ceasing. What is it? I do nothing but meditate on the word. <laughs> All I do is meditate on the word. I'll share now. This has happened. I, I, I memorized the book of James because <clears throat> some years ago, and I kept telling the congregation, I says, I'm going to preach on the book of James. I said, I've memorized the book of James. And I took the book of James. This was back in 19, it was probably 1996 or 7. Well, I was amazed. I mean, we had <clears throat> almost 200 people to come out and hear me going to do the book of James. And I meditate on it. Man, I meditate, meditate, not just memorize it. I, I meditate, 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 go over it, go over it. I, I sing I sing the scriptures, I'll memorize the scripture, and then I'll sing it. You don't want to hear me sing it, but I'll begin to sing it. So I'm here, <clears throat> and I begin to preach on the book of James. As I'm preaching on the book of James, something is going on in this church. People begin to weep and cry. Now, I preach a lot of sermons. They never weeped and cried before, but it's the word of God. The Holy Spirit is taking the word of God and is quickening it to their hearts. When I gave the altar call, they literally ran for the altar. Grown men and women ran for the altar. They're weeping, crying, wailing. I'm standing there not knowing what to do. When I was down in Surinam two years ago, I did that once again. I was in a very large church, and I had taken the book of James, you can ask my son, and they didn't have no meetings for me, so I think it was for about three days. I said, I don't want to be bothered. Maybe it wasn't that long. So I got in there, and I just began, to mem just began to go over the book of James, book of James, book of James, meditating, meditating. I already memorized it years before. Meditating, meditating, meditating. And then I went to this very large church, <clears throat> and I could tell that I wasn't going to fit very well. I was going to be like a square peg in a round hole. I talked to the person who began the church, and I, I could tell. I thought, well, I better give them what I can. So I got up, and I didn't have my glasses on. And so the first set of, the church is so massive that the first set of chairs was probably from here to that back wall. So I couldn't really see very well what was going on. I began to preach the book of James. The person who's doing the interpretation, she's behind me, so she can't even see my mouth. So she keeps stopping me. She's saying, ho, ho, what did you say? What did you say? And then I'd have to repeat it all over again. I thought, man, this is a disaster. This is an utter disaster. I can't even preach this thing clear because her back is to me. She don't know what I'm saying. The apostle sitting on the front seat, she's anxious. You can tell she wants me to shut up. I'm trying to get through the book of James. I'm frustrated, really. This is what happened. But I'm seeing motion out there. Something's happening out in the crowd. There's something happening. I don't know what's going on out there. So I, I finally get done. I thought, okay, I can't do this. I'll just quit. So I gave an order call. I thought, well, nobody's going to respond to this. It's a disaster. This really happened. This is a disaster. That whole area from big, wider than this room all the way to the back wall was filled with weeping, crying, wailing people. 
I thought, wow. Okay. So I can't pray for all these people. So I said, I need help. I need help. But people weren't helping. I'm going, why aren't they helping? So we left the church. Sister Rafis, who set up the meeting, about three days later, we're going to go do another meeting. And she says, she says, oh, that was amazing. I said, what? <laughs> she said, well, what happened? And she named the big church. She said, that was amazing. I said, what do you mean that was amazing? She said, well, when you gave the order call. I said, what? She said, that was all the church's leadership. I said, what? She said, they were all the leaders of the church. I said, no way. She said, and man, when you were preaching, she said, the people were being thrown out of their chairs. I said, what? She said they were being thrown out of their chairs. It's the word of God hid in our hearts. And meditated. Scripture after scripture that says that. The voice of God hid in your heart, meditated, meditated, not just memorized. God will show up. Remember, God confirms his word with what? Signs following. Father, I thank you now that this word will not return void. I believe there is going to be an explosion of your word back in the earth. Mm. Oh, I believe that there is going to be a revival of the truth. I believe people are going to stop trying. Those who love the word will stop trying to come up with quaint little statements, little declarations they can take their name to. And they're just simply going to begin to hide the word in their heart. Meditate upon the word. Give themselves to the word in prayer. And when they stand up in the pulpit, you are going to fill their mouth. And you are going to confirm your word. And your sheep are going to hear your voice. It will cleanse, purify, sanctify, separate, and make your people one with you. Lord, I thank you for it now. In Jesus' name.